Live from the land of DuckTales comes the adventures of Lux and Ember. <laughs> but, but seriously, this is Lux and Ember. And this is our thoughts on the DuckTale reboot, season one, episodes six through nine, creator's order, not broadcast. And once again, we're going to start this episode with what Disney showed and what the actual order is. So we're watching six through nine, which the actual order is House of the Lucky Gander, Infernal Internship of Mark Beaks, Living Mummies of Toth Ra, and Terror of the Terraformas, Terraformians, which was broadcast as... First one was episode 7, 8, 8, yes I know that's weird, and 6. So they moved the season finale to right after episode 4 because they wanted to make sure the little kitties didn't get lost. And forget who the frick Lena was, even though, come on, really? Yeah, Disney, kids aren't stupid. Though if that's the reasoning behind how short your commercial breaks are on the app, keep believing that. <laughs> yeah. Because your commercial breaks in the app are awesome. We actually watch the commercials because they're only 15 seconds. Yeah, the app says you have a total of four commercials, but it's usually just two commercials and two initial, initials or whatever they're called. Basically, little, basically logo sections. So it totals out of like about 33 seconds total for the entire commercial break. Which is pretty dang awesome. Yes! And we watch the commercials. The goal was achieved. The commercials were actually viewed. And they were interesting to us. Um, Sasame-chan, Amber is actually now interested in maybe watching that one particular show you said you might want us to watch. I never said I was opposed, but the 15 second spot intrigues me. Here's the problem with the Disney app. We can only watch like half of the current season. We can't go back and watch all of the show. Now if they did that, it would be the perfect app. You would get us to watch more. You get us to watch your commercials more. Yeah, but Disney's working on its own streaming service, so... Hmm. Though, how short the commercial breaks are, and the fact that there were all Disney properties, tells me that that's the reason these commercial breaks are so short. Disney can make them short. If they actually got commercials from other people, those other people may force them to run the entire length of the commercial. But moving on from the commercials to, oh my god, this series. Yes. I was actually a little bit disappointed in the House of the Lucky Gander. I can see that. Well, it really should have tied into him being lucky because of the cricket, or the cricket somehow transferring the luck to or away from someone. Other than that, it was good. I didn't really expect that. I expected kind of like what happened, which was the cricket was going to be a gag at the end, or we weren't going to see it at all. I was actually surprised when we got to the end and Scrooge was like, okay, we can go now. Because I really didn't think they had enough time to still make it to see the cricket because they were supposed to leave in an hour. And yes, I know that the cartoon is like 23 minutes, but it didn't seem like all of that would have happened in just an hour in the story universe time. Well, here's the thing. I think time inside... That place was also distorted. Probably, because that's kind of how casinos work. Also, the moment I saw that frog guy, I was like, he doesn't look like other people from this universe. He doesn't belong. He's what's trapping everyone. Well, I was perfectly willing to believe that he was not a supernatural creature, just one of those, oh, the standard casino thing of, we will do anything to keep you from going outside. Because that's how casinos work. That's why a lot of casinos allow smoking. Because if you had to go outside for your smoke break, you might leave. Also the type of music they play, how everything's arranged, where you have to go, what paths lead you past certain things. The fact that a lot of places, if you're a member, give you free drinks. A lot of places give you free non-alcoholic drinks anyways. And usually it's either cheap or free to become a member there. So, yeah, casinos. I love how Gander asked Donald there because of his bad luck. I also love the flashback of how bad... For a second there, I was thinking that Gander was taking the luck from Donald. I was considering that too, that he was absorbing any luck that Donald might have had. But apparently Donald's luck is just bad overall. His luck is... Awful! Awful! I 
love how we basically went three, two, one, and that basically led up to Scrooge going three, two, one. <laughs> so we had the right idea. Our timing was a little bit off, but our timing was to Scrooge counting down. Yes. Uh, basically, here's the reveal. <laughs> like, no, no, we didn't free the rest of the family just to leave Donald behind. We freed everyone. Because Scrooge talked the creature into taking Donald instead of Gander. Just so much fun. Also, let's see. Was that? Yeah, that was last episodes with the fever. So many episodes. <laughs> yes, yes. We did manage to take a break between each set of four so that hopefully we wouldn't have too much overbleed on our recordings. But you guys know how we are. Yeah, and... We did take actually breaks between each episode, got some water and some snackage and some tea. Ooh, wonderful tea. It's like, yes. hey, this company that makes this tea, sponsor us, please. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, notice I didn't say a name because it's a joke, but this tea was good. <laughs> so what next episode, or was there more from this episode you wanted to talk about? Because I'm having trouble remembering more than just the raw episode now. Burritos. What is this burrito? <laughs> well had a little more on the casino episode and I temporarily lost it with your segue, but I've got it back. The, I love how devious Scrooge is. Not just the thing at the end, but where he sounds like he's giving in of, oh, all right, check me into the hotel. The doors are always <laughs> next to the check-in counter. <laughs> yeah. So running, <laughs> because that's the thing. Scrooge isn't about luck. He's about being tougher than the toughies and smarter than the smarties. And he continuously proves that. He earned his way to where he is. He didn't just rely on luck or other people handing him things. Oh, look, a 20. Yes, and how Gander at the end of that episode is like, have I just been coasting by? I need to change. Hey, dude, I need to get rid of my boat for tax reasons. I'll sell it to you for $20. I am back, baby! Like, I don't know who I want to... Mm, what would be appropriate? Uh, pie in the face? More? Gander or Mark Beaks? Yeah. For most of that episode, I wanted to shoot him. Very much so. And if you look at the title sequence, apparently he's going to be a recurring villain. From what I understand about some of the stuff I read before the series came out, yeah. Well, he's in the four-panel split in the title sequence. Also, another interesting thing I noticed about the title sequence that I didn't really pick up on until the last couple of episodes in the, our previous video is the fact that, wait a minute, Screw Loose is in the group of villains chasing after everyone. Is he a villain in this series? <laughs> because I remember him being a good guy. Well, he was kind of the absent-minded inventor, and his big success was the gizmo duck suit, which he was never supposed to wear. They were going to find someone to wear it, and then Fenton stumbled onto accidentally getting it. But if, going backwards to the last set of episodes, since we're talking about Screwloose, Gyro was plotting out when we saw him going over that list and doing the decision tree, basically, he just came up with the idea for Gizmo Duck, and it sounds like he intends to be the one under the armor. Yeah, which would be interesting, but I have this odd feeling that we're going to get Fenton, and he's going to accidentally stumble onto the armor. I have a feeling we're going to keep that. And yeah, the Tothra episode was interesting, because it was like, oh, the mummies are not mummies. There's this whole society living oppressed and they don't even realize they're oppressed and they're living inside a pyramid that apparently was the pyramid undiscovered or what was inside the pyramid undiscovered i'm guessing it's what was inside the pyramid ah uh, lunch pad lunch pad launch pad that also reminds me in the gander episode lucky gander episode i want to watch an episode about lunch pads exploits on that yes what exactly he was doing because he came back all kitted out warrior style like arrows sticking in him and a small panda child on his back and an eye patch yes and he kept going oh i'll find you again or something yes i'll find you someday so it almost sounds like never ran into the girl 
but had plenty of adventures. So, I mean, it was a convenient way to get Launchpad out of the way, but I would like to know what happened. Is this like a hint to Darkwing Duck? <laughs> because if Launchpad can get away like that, then he might be able to help Darkwing. Because that was always the real question about Launchpad and Darkwing, is the fact that they apparently do exist in the same world as DuckTales. So is Launchpad no longer his pilot? Or, you know, because that was the real question, because those series were running at the same time at least near the end of DuckTales and how short of a run Darkwing had. Uh, but back to this series. That's what I really wanted to. It's like, I want to know. You got me intrigued. Yes. Tell me more. What happened next? What happened before? What happened, period? <laughs> uh, can I go over to the, the Terra Firm episode? This is more interesting than the movie. Also, wow, they really brought it together in the third act. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to go over on the... There's actually, there's plenty more to go over on the Tora. Tara, whatever. Yes, there's a lot there because, wow, okay. So your ancestors started this as a thing to have the people keep faith, but everyone else is skinny and you're kind of heavy. So you're eating all the offerings and you could open the sky hatch for longer and help them grow more stuff. But no, you're basically a petty tyrant. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, wait a minute. If you can open up this thing and they have to grow crops to sacrifice to you, how about you, like, leave it open for longer? So that they could actually grow some crops? Because I want to know where you got that fruit. Because there was nothing like that in any of the harvests that we saw. And it looked too good to actually come from anything that was harvested in there. So, dude, were you, like, sneaking out? Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. Also, I didn't think those were burritos at first. What Launchpad was snacking on? Me either. Yeah, I thought, was some type of, I thought it was some type of candy bar. That's kind of where I was going. And it totally makes sense that they're like, we're going to go outside for the burritos. If you think about what they've been eating, if they had, other than probably dying from the shock of really rich food, they had anything from the outside world. That would be enough reason to go, because they're barely scraping by here. Mm -hmm. So, we're all satisfied. We don't need to revolt. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> what is this delicious food, and how can we obtain it? It's outside. Okay, uprising! <laughs> because food, water, shelter, basic needs. If those needs are not being met, or you find something that would meet them better... Yeah. Also, am I the only one who finds it creepy that the puppet that the guard was controlling was actually the mummy? Uh, basically, you were manipulating a dead body to... Yeah. yeah. I didn't find it that creepy because I wasn't thinking too hard about it. Thanks, Amber. <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, I get it. Yeah, that works. Then she just now went, isn't it like this? Isn't that kind of creepy? I'm like... Yeah, that is kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that actually looked like a pretty nice kaposh that Louis got his hands on. And that is where I turn to Emperor and go, you know what that is? <laughs> yes, yes, because I once read a book where the main character had that as their primary weapon. Because I saw it in the pile of treasure, I went, oh, a kaposh, that looks nice. Yeah, and I was <laughs> like, what? And I thought for a moment there, it would be the key to like, cutting him apart or something, but I guess it just works well as distraction. Though apparently it is something sacred. I wonder if it'll lead to anything in the future. It might, because I think that this group is going to have connecting story points. Like, a lot of their adventures they collect things on. I am thinking that's going to be important to the Magicka Dispel arc, but I also like the end where, my, my money! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, here, I'll pay for this. Finds out it's $9,000. Let go of the credit card. Uh, I have a feeling that's a reaction gif. My, my money! <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And also getting rewarded with a burrito at the end. I would have not taken a bite out of it. I would have immediately offered to trade with Launchpad, who probably would have traded. <laughs> oh, it was also kind of nice that he's like, hmm, this actually isn't that bad. Because you have to wonder with his Scottish heritage if... Scrooge McDuck has ever bothered to eat a burrito. He's probably had haggis? Or is that Irish? I always forget, even though I'm part Irish. I think I'm also part Scottish, so that's kind of a fun oh, thing right there. We're in the U.S. We're mostly mutts. So, 
I like how they emphasize how controlling Scrooge is about his money in this series in such subtle ways. So, next episode. Well, let's talk a little more about how annoying Mark Beeks is. Oh yeah, we need to really focus on that episode now. Oh my god. Could they have written this guy any more annoying? I know he's supposed to be a bad guy, but oh my god. Yeah, it's like, wow, I actually like Glomgold more now. Yes, though I love how in his plan to go after this guy, it was also a plan to go after Scrooge. Yes, that it was ultimately a plan to go after Scrooge, and that getting rid of Mark Beeks was just part of the elaborate plan to get to Scrooge. And I love how he's still going through with it. And I did not realize that beard was removable. Neither did I. As we were both like, is that? Is that uh, like Glomgold? That has to be Glomgold. But he doesn't have a beard. And then takes off whatever disguise he had and puts on the beard. We're like, oh, so it's fake. So takes off the mustache and puts on the beard. It's like, wow, did not realize it worked like that. I guess it's all part of his, I'm more Scottish than you. I'm wearing a kilt, McDuff. A kilt. So I kind of had the idea that he might be faking or it's not something that really big that he was actually promoting. But almost, oh my God, the fact that he, it was all just hype. Yes, it was like a whole 90s dot com bust thing, you know, where all the internet companies were skyrocketing on potential and they had nothing backing them. And here's the real question is, after people find out about this, is he keeping that money somewhere else? Because people are going to be getting their money back. Even if he doesn't give it back to him, there's courts, laws. He's going to be losing money other ways. Yeah, so he's probably going to drop out of the billionaire's club because it's going to go below billion. But as he pointed out that he was firing the boys so that even if they told the truth, he could just say it was a revenge plot. And when the boys took the phone and typed, they didn't type about it being a lie. They typed something stupid and got a thousand likes on it, which is still very good revenge. Yeah, I actually expected that the reveal on that would be that they actually typed in important information, but they just said that they typed in my face looks like a butt. But apparently that's what they actually typed because Mark got the phone back and could look at it and see what it said. And there would have been a reaction right there if they had typed the truth. They, he may not have had time to scroll down because he, you only live once on the way down. I was like, oh, we're fitting in a YOLO joke. That's awesome. Yeah, because he's supposed to be one of those dot-com millionaires. I, I remember dot-com millionaire being one of the categories we talked about being added to modernize the series. But just to sound horribly derogatory right now, it's just going, dang millennials. <laughs> Which we both technically are. And millennials aren't even a thing, really. We're all just people. Yeah, the world changes so quickly that the defining tactics used to define generations don't really fit anymore. Because it's supposed to be marked out by big events that happen that tie a group of people together and shape their experiences. Things change too quickly for that now. And I actually love several things about this episode, like the fact that every time his phone got broke, he pulled out another one. He had like six phones, and that very last one was his last backup phone. And Gray was so happy about that. I was actually surprised by the fact that he actually hired the guy, though that kind of makes sense with how he was reacting. Because he wasn't too terribly freaked out. Except when his coffee wasn't going to be delivered at the right time. Yes, the 214 coffee is apparently a world of difference from the 215 copy. Yeah, so I have a feeling in the future when we encounter this guy again, Dewey is going to give a hint to Scrooge, and Scrooge is going to go, Ah! Because <laughs> if he's that anal about a minute being off, he might be anal about other stuff, like how he likes certain things arranged, or how things have to be on a schedule, so if Scrooge can delay him from doing whatever his big plan is in whatever episode he encounters Scrooge again. That will drive the guy up the wall. But I think Huey would be more likely to give that tip because Huey's the more organized one. Or both of them. Yes, since they both have experience with this guy. I love how the suitcase was actually Glumgold's. That was awesome. I'm like, seriously, you guys just ripped Glumgold off for 20 grand and nobody has noticed this yet. 
I also love the fact that if you think about it, that 20 grand will is barely a dent for Glomgold, especially if he's the second richest and he's only so much below Scrooge. No matter how much is like, okay, he's the second richest, he's still going to be the second richest, but he didn't notice that the briefcase was missing. Also, another dig at Glomgold's intelligence level. The passcode on the briefcase was the factory default setting. Oh, this series is awesome. Also, for a second there, I thought the base of his hoverboard, basically think of it as a, um, yeah, what we call hoverboards nowadays. He was basically riding around. I thought the base of that was actually a bird perch because he's a bird. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's a nice touch. Well, most of them are birds. We have the birds, we have the beagles, we have the pandas, but primarily birds because, you know, it's Duckburg. Makes sense. Dun dun. <laughs> and also the finale, the Terraformians, I was like, I vaguely remember this episode. I was trying to remember the um, Terraformians too. And the fact that I just realized it just popped back into my head. The story Webby was telling in the modern version is actually what happened in the original episode. But apparently that's not what's going on in this one because they both went, I bet you that's the prince of the... <laughs> the way they had it mirrored because they had all the Terraformians arranged in the same order as the Duckburg crew. And they even had the colors match. So everyone was color represented Terraformian to the ducks. You know, and that whole fun finger touch thing with the boop. I was like, yeah, you guys are going for a total E.T. moment here. Very nicely handled. I was like, what are they going to... Oh, okay. I was thinking maybe fist bump or hand clasp, but just more of a... Okay, we touched it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually more like, confirmed to be real. Okay, I'm going to write this down in my notebook. Okay, we're good. <laughs> and I also like all the stuff they're doing for Magicka. Also, we watched the end of... Birthday Bash again. And we confirmed that she does say... Aunt Magicka. Which is very interesting because we know Lena had a troubled family life because that's been broadly hinted to. Possibly even an actual orphan as opposed to abandoned like the nephews. And we don't know what happened to Webby's parents. Hmm. So that could be something else that Lena and Webgale have in common is not having parents in their lives. The difference is Webgale had... Mrs. Beakley. So here's the real question of that. Is she backstabbing Webby? Is she backstabbing Magicka? Is she double crossing Magicka, doubles crossing Webby, or triple crossing everyone? Because she refused to listen to Magicka. Also, she had to shift. Magicka was showing as her shadow. And so she had to move to the side so that the light wasn't falling correctly, which would explain why the things that we've seen her do have all been at night. The party was at night, the movie was at night, the subway is underground, fewer chances of casting that shadow. And I like how her shadow went back to normal when she started using a lot of Magicka's apparently power. And Magicka stopped fighting. It was more of, no, stop this, don't do this, leave her be. And then Lena wouldn't listen, and then the shadow went back to normal. So Lena has some level of control here. Also, it was awesome how she used her powers. That was kind of cool. I also love the last minute, grip, yank. And that's how she got respect of... Mrs. Beakley. Though she was starting to get some before for having some skill in the vandalism department. Also, she showed Lena some kindness in pulling her up onto the train and holding her close. Because even though Mrs. Beakley didn't approve of Lena at that point, she is still a child. And... Mrs. Beakley is one heck of a mama bear. You do not mess with a woman like that. I am just one hell of a butler. <laughs> I am not your butler! <laughs> no, I am not your secretary! <laughs> I was going with butler there to continue the joke. Yes, and so she won Mrs. Beakley over, which was a huge goal, no matter which version of the game she's playing. Because if she really wants to befriend Webigail and... Backstab Magicka, she's going to need all their help. Mm -hmm. Especially Scrooge. Especially, because he has the most experience. But Miss Beakley is incredibly skilled. So the two of them. I love how some of the oldest characters on the show are the most kick tail. Mm -hmm. I love how you were trying to figure out Scrooge's age based on the Snowcap episode. 
Well, I was like, okay, that was 75 years ago, and he'd already made his first million, so... He's probably anywhere from 16 to 18, so that makes him... I'm really interested to see how Lena's part plays out. I'm really hoping that she either is planning from the very beginning to backstab Magica, or she ends up choosing to backstab Magica, because I really don't want to see Webigail lose the first friend that she's made outside the family. Also, I love this show's broad definition of family, because Webigail has no relation to the Duck or McDuck name, but she's counted as family. Uh, and I was just remembering the whole sequence of when Huey, Dewey, and Louie are getting sick completely by accident. Like, no, we're not. You're like, don't no, pay attention to this. Super kind of Yes, yeah, so just saying the most off-the-wall things and staying in sync. And you can definitely tell that that episode was definitely meant to be like a finale to something. Not really a finale, but like a mid-season thing. It was definitely a climactic sequence. Mm -hmm. So it was not intended to be shown as early as Disney showed it. And that reminds me, like, this is another show that the music is so good, especially that one scene where we were just talking about how Lena levitated everything. The music there was so awesome. It really fit and it was very powerful and it really pulled you in and dialed you into that moment and the struggle she was having to use that power and take those actions because she was controlling two things at once. She was lifting the train car and moving Mrs. Beakley out of the way. So that's controlling two objects at once, one that weighs several tons and one that is a fragile, for lack of a better word, human creature. That sounds so much better than saying anthropomorphic duck. <laughs> uh, so anything else you want to go over? No, that was really the main stuff because I'm really interested to see how the whole Magicka Dispel thing is going to play out. Glomgold's continuing to show that he's really a minor threat because Scrooge can consistently outsmart him, but he is still a threat. He's more of a threat than the Beagle family. I think he's a real threat because of his wealth. And I can't wait to see how this rivalry started in this version of the show. It would be really interesting to learn that. And, you know, also having the whole thing of Glomgold falls into a lot of the classic villain tropes of like the overcomplicated plan and the gloating. Because I mean, he even says it in his presentation, you always have to start with the declaration of hatred. The only thing I'm hoping for the next set of episodes that Disney releases is that they don't mess with the order. It would be really nice to be able to watch them as they come out. Also, it makes it a lot easier to pick up the DVDs. Because they're going to release them in this order, most likely. Unless the... Creators actually get a say in it. I mean, we just recently got a good release of Ladybug, thanks to Shout Factory. I wonder if Shout Factory is going to um, go to Disney and go, hey, can we release these in the proper order? Disney would probably say no. Disney is very... Um, Controlling. Yes. You know, you don't really mess with the Empire. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> very much so, especially since they now have that property. Yep. Not that we didn't always have a little bit of a crossover with Star Tours. I always wondered how that worked. Yeah, so outro. Outro. I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on Disney's reboot of DuckTales, Season 1, Episodes 6 through 9, Creator's Order. Come on, we just did a thing on DuckTales, which is about Duckburg's richest duck. You think we're not going to talk money? So, we have the... Super cheap, the kind of cheap, and it varies. So super cheap is going to be the base tier of Patreon, which is $1. You can go higher, but we're talking cheap versus less cheap. Uh, monthly sketches plus the ability to suggest and vote on those suggestions. Okay, and then mid is going to be coffee, K-O-F-I, which works in increments of $3. Okay, now we get to the stuff that actually costs more than coffee which would be commissions. So yeah, that depends on what you want. And he's willing to draw a lot. There are some exclusions and some rules and some details and some pricing. So you can find all of that in the commission link. And now our usual spiel. If you enjoy Lux's art, 
Well, you must if you're considering a commission or the Patreon. You can find more of it on Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, Google+, Facebook, Mastodon servers, Reddit, and wherever else he remembers to post it. Or news places that he finds. Uh, to help support this channel non-financially, like, subscribe, comment, watch other episodes. Right now, the biggest thing for us is getting more subscribers and more watch time. We might actually get our ad revenue back. Thank you again for listening. Thank you to all our current subscribers, commenters, and patrons.